Thank you. A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized them and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even a fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Last week, uh, my first Sunday here, I used a metaphor of this being like a blind date. Uh, I didn't really know you very well, and you didn't know me, and yet we came together, and uh, we worked with one another, and so uh, here it is, the second week. I'm here, and you're here, so maybe it went okay. <laughs> maybe things are okay. I love this chapter in uh, Mark's Gospel. It, it is a fascinating study about the, a day in the life of Jesus and his followers. And if you read it from stem to stern, and Elizabeth only read two of the vignettes, there are six vignettes that happen in this chapter. And they all occur on the same day, and they all are very busy. They are busyness embodied. And underneath is a current of the need to pause and rest. Here are the six vignettes. One is the rejection in Nazareth. He goes back to his hometown. They size him up, up and down, and determine little Jesus has grown up, and now who is this guy? And it becomes a form of rejection. Second one is the mission of the 12. He sets his 12 uh, disciples loose and gives them assignment, and they head off and they work and they come back. The third is the death of John the Baptist. The news arrives, and it is sweeping across the countryside because the whole country had been uh, enamored by John the baptizer, who was incredibly bold. And he was down at the river, and people would leave the highlands of Jerusalem. They would go down to the river to hear him preach and to be baptized. Fourth one is the feeding of the 5,000. It turns right around into a meal. How do we feed these people is the issue. After that is walking on water. These are all the highlights in Jesus' ministry, the favorite stories we tell. And the last is the healing of the sick. People were pouring out of these little villages with their sick or crippled friend or family member and coming to Jesus out of desperation. If you had that much demand placed on you in one single day, how crazy would you be? You would be nutty crazy. Why couldn't they just let him alone for a minute? Why couldn't they just give him a moment of his own time? Why did they have to follow him? Everywhere that he went, they would run along and they would chase him. Why couldn't they give him one blessed moment to himself? They couldn't. They were compelled. They were manic about their needs. They were just, they were just so desperate. 
They were like little children who could only think of themselves demanding. They wanted him. They needed him. And they needed him right now. And couldn't they see that he was wounded? They, could they have any appreciation at all for his own personal pain? And you might ask, I don't remember him being wounded. But when the news came early in the day about the, the killing of his cousin, John the Baptizer, it was like a wave, a tsunami coming over and, and sweeping over the whole country. And for Jesus, in a personal way, this was a big, big deal. He was wounded. He was grieving. So we read this simple series of stories, this sequence of things, and yet there's something amiss about it. Jesus tried to pull away. He was talking about it several times in the day. He would say to his disciples, you know what we need to do? We need to, we need to stop for a little bit. We need to inhale. We need to exhale. Sort of like what we did when we came into worship. So many people just tear themselves up getting up and having breakfast and getting ready and getting the kids in the car. I mean, it's a huge, huge deal. And the need to sit down and to relax is something that we all share. Jesus had just come from his hometown, people that he had known all of his life, people who had nurtured him in the ways of the world. He had come back home to the village that had raised him. They remembered little Jesus. And that's what happens. Sometimes we leave home. When did you finally leave home? Uh, different ones come and go at different times, but the fact that you left home, you don't come back later as the same person. Something is changing and evolving in you from the simple matter of leaving home. We grow and we're changed. We're not the same person. Something is afoot in our lives because we begin to change. And Jesus made a point of going home early. In the early days of his teaching ministry, his, his reputation is rising in the countryside. The little villages are talking about him. It was a big deal for him to go home. They whispered in his hometown, where did he get this wisdom? Uh, it, it, any conversation with him stirred up the notion of how wise he actually was. How does he do these deeds of power, demonstrable demonstrations of his power? How does he do that? Isn't this the carpenter's son, they said? That wasn't all. Then the news that Herod had executed John the baptizer came. Maybe that's what stimulated the crowds. You know, in our communities, when something very tragic happens, everybody goes on alert. The whole community can share the shock of what has just happened. Maybe the crowds were disturbed by their own deep sense of grief and shock. This was the people's prophet. He wasn't up in Jerusalem in the temple. He wasn't in the halls of power. John the baptizer had risen up out of nothing. And he was preaching boldly, not like they do up at the big house. He was preaching boldly and he was asking people to convert, to change their way of being. This is the way it works. Uh, Jesus was absorbed in this tragic news. It was painful to him, and he realized he needed to get away from it all. He needed silence and solitude. He needed to figure out what all this meant. Friday night, I went to a birthday party from <clears throat> a bunch of dear friends that gathered in honor of their pastor who followed me at the church I was at over on Holmes Road. This was 20 years ago now, 15 years ago. And one of the leading laymen in that church lost his wife 
a year ago. She just up and died about a year ago. She was in her 50s. It was total shock to the whole community. My friend John is, is still dealing with the loss of his wife. He tried to continue on for the strength of his kids, his grown kids. He tried to continue on in his job. He's an architect here in the city. His work in the church, he did all kinds of things, all manner of things. He realized he couldn't keep it up. And he took the Family Medical Leave Act. He took two months. He's taking 60 days to put aside his work in order that he might tend to himself. His grief, his loneliness, the shock of abruptly losing his partner in life. I could not applaud him more, partly knowing what this sermon is about today, about the need to stop and a pause. Where do caregivers go when they grieve? Some of you have been caregivers all your life. Who cares for them when pain overwhelms them? Just when Jesus needed time alone to absorb this world of pain, the crowds chased after him. In fact, it's so visual. You can see Jesus and the disciples in a boat. It's a pretty good sized boat. It has the 13 of them. They go out away from the shore and they can see, visually see the crowds picking up and they're on the trails along the side of the lake. It's sort of not a lake, it's a sea, the Sea of Galilee. But they see them and they're watching Jesus in the boat and they're trying to be wherever it is that he comes to shore. It's visual. He could just see the crowds at work. And so there were so many people and there was so much pain and there was so much, uh, so many mouths to feed, so much need in the world. Here's what it says in the scripture. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Ever with the metaphors, these were sheep. They needed him. And what a powerful thing to say that Jesus had compassion for them. He looked upon them and he could feel the energy of pain and loss and sorrow in their hearts. He could get into their skin and understand them. And so he stopped running. He'd been running up to this point, trying to get away. He had gotten away. It did no good whatsoever and he stopped. He put his own needs aside like a father who raises his children and then sacrifices his own needs. Or like the mother who works to make sure that they have everything that they need in life. There's a pathology in our time that's woven into our lives as much as we breathlessly run from one thing to the other. How many of you carry a list? I do on occasion. Some of you are list people. Some of you deal with it as it pops up, and that's okay too. It's a different way of living life. It's a sign of how crazy, though, that we can be, that we have these lists, and some of them are just tucked away in our brains, how much we have to get done. Jesus understood the problem of working so fast, one gets disoriented. The chaos of having too much to do is disorienting. You lose your sense of direction. Eventually, you lose your sense of self. And as the pace of ministry quickened, so did they. Jesus felt this as much as anyone. Uh, I was laughing uh, with somebody in the early service um, who's about my age. And when I say, do you know the name Alvin Toffler? She knew. She had studied Alvin Toffler a futurist. It was a field that didn't even have a field of study until about the 80s. This issue about what's, what's the future going to look like? Alvin Toffler was a futurist, and he had a book that talked about the diminishing returns we have the busier we get. 
He contended that the rate of acceleration of life was increasing slowly, ever so slowly, but forward, and it was getting tighter and tighter. His, uh, his metaphor for this is being on a merry-go-round. I joked about jumping on a, on a merry-go-round. Imagine yourself to go to the fair and get on a merry-go-round and you're riding up and down. The calliope is playing and it's, maybe you're on a horse and your friend is on, I don't know what else, animal. But you're just enjoying the motion and the movement. Now imagine that somebody turns the speed up just a little bit. And now you hold tighter, but it's still pretty okay. The wind is blowing in your face. That's lovely. Imagine they turn it up another notch or two, and now you're really spinning. And you have to hang on for all you're, you're able to do. And no matter what you do, it's going faster and faster and faster. And what began as a children's ride becomes a horror tale. You are frightened to death. And that's, that's what Alvin Toffler was trying to say, is that we're moving faster and faster in the world, and we're getting less out of it. Here's the illustration, the luxury of having time to eat. Some of you eat at your computer, at your keyboard. You've got a sandwich in one hand, and you know, you're banging away on your computer. Uh, maybe you drive and you've got food in your lap and you're driving. Nutty, it's nutty what we do because we don't even take time to enjoy a meal. Jesus recognized this as a form of busy sickness. And he said to them, now come along. You can just see him, he's just kind of asking, now come along with me to some quiet place and rest for a while. At my most anxious moments in pastoring, I noticed it in my right foot by working that accelerator pretty tight. And I recognized in my body the signs of anxiety. And I began to learn to take deep breaths and then to exhale and to feel my body responding by resting. Rest can be whatever you do when you're not doing something else. Maybe a couple of the disciples in the boat, you know, got to the shore and went back out in the boat and fished. They cast their nets. Maybe that wasn't work. Maybe that was very relaxing. Another one laid on the shore and just looked up at the clouds going by. Maybe one or two took a nap. Lord knows they needed to take a nap. Others may have simply enjoyed quiet time alone. Later in the day, they came together for a meal. The community came back together and shared a meal together. There's an ancient tradition that when the Apostle John was pastor in Ephesus, his hobby was raising pigeons. It is said that on one occasion, a person, someone in his community of faith, walked by and uh, after having been out hunting and recognized it was John and playing with his pigeons, trying to get them healthy and to take care of them. And, and the, man, the man gently chided John for spending his time so frivolously. And John looked at the hunter's bow and noticed that the string was not taut. It was, had it been released. And and he asked the man about that, and he said, yeah, I always loosen the string when it's not in use. If it stayed tight all the time, it would lose its power. And John responded, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm relaxing the bow of my mind, so I'll be better able to shoot the arrows of divine truth. <clears throat> it's counterintuitive in a way. That if you want to get more done, try to build in times of slack and of rest. Jesus understood the need for rest because he understood the principle of Sabbath. This is, this is at the heart of Hebrew faith. The roots of Sabbath began in the creation stories. 
in Genesis where it says quite plainly on the seventh day, God finished the work he, that he had done and he rested. There's the example. Arthur Waskow, the director of the Shalom Center, says Shabbat is a time you stop doing. Maybe you study Torah. Maybe you sing. Maybe you dance. You celebrate and you reflect on the previous six days. There's a time to sort things out. We get so caught up in the problems that we're not quite sure what to do. Shabbat is a time at which we have the opportunity. And there's a metaphor that Waskow shared. He said, artists have explained that there's a moment in painting when you're laying brush stroke after brush stroke after brush stroke upon a painting, and each one is beautiful and it adds to the luster of the painting that you're, you're creating, it enhances it, and then there's a moment where you add one more stroke and you risk the possibility of ruining it. We do that in life. Oh, I can get that done. I can, I can make that happen. And we risk in life the possibility, this possibility of knowing when to stop the wisdom of knowing when to stop, to say, whoosh, this, is, this one's over. I'm going to pause and rest. Well, he's right in this story. We labor so diligently, we stand in jeopardy of losing our souls as payment for the work we do. We add brushstroke after brushstroke, and the painting of our lives becomes uglier and uglier. We work endlessly because we feel trapped by the demands of our jobs. We need to re rediscover the meaning of Shabbat, of Sabbath. The Puritans had a saying, good Sabbaths make good Christians. The simplicity of being a follower of Christ in the world can be as simple as holding back some rather than expending everything. Rest and worship one day a week will make a profound difference in the living of this great faith we have received through Christ. And so we say with the Jewish uh, people, Shabbat Shalom. You hear that a lot in Israel. Shabbat Shalom on the Sabbath day. Sabbath peace. May you have Shabbat Shalom in your life. Amen.